For the love of our Holy Prophet Muhammad, let us have a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity for thanking the community and the organizers for inviting me and thanking all the volunteers in advance for all of their service in this month of Muharram and an opportunity to ask you to help me with the success of these majalis. And what I mean by that is that normally whenever I go for any majlis, any muhadara, <coughs> there are certain rules that I like to have in place for the majlis. <coughs> So the first rule is the following. And everybody has to get their Qur'ans out or the phones out and be able to have a look at the ayat that we are going to be discussing. So I ask all of you, you have your phones? You all have phones with you, correct? So please open your phones and either open the app that you have, the Qur'an app, whatever it is, or if you want to Google the ayat, you can do so. Now, there's trust here. If I tell you, open your phones, you're not allowed to be looking at WhatsApp, you're not allowed to be on Instagram or TikTok or anything like this, okay? So I have trust that you're going to look at the phone for the purpose of searching the ayat. So in every muhadara, we are going to have a number of ayat that we're going to discuss. And I don't like it to be passive with the Quran. So that if I say a verse, you actually read the ayah for yourself. Which means all of us have to have the Qur'an to hand or the phone to hand and be able to search the ayah. Why? Because if you're reading the ayat, you will more likely pay attention to the verse. You'll more likely note where the ayah is. And there is blessing in making sure that we become very adept with the Qur'an itself. So this is rule number one. Rule number two is that if you want to be able to take notes, or rather we encourage you to take notes on your phone. So you all have maybe a note section on your phone. As you're listening to the discussion, if you find something of benefit, if you have some question, note it down, and you'll always be able to refer back to it. Even many, many years later, inshallah, the muhadarat will stay fresh in the mind. So rule number two. Rule number three is that in the discussion, I will ask you questions. I want your opinion. So if I say, what do you think about this ayah? Or have you experienced this? Don't be shy. Feel to reply back and engage in the discussion. And inshallah, it will become very normal that this becomes not a monologue, but a dialogue, inshallah. <coughs> Rule number three. And rule number four is that at the end <coughs> or at the, during every single muhadara, I will give homework. Don't look so shocked, huh? Has school finished? School's finished? You're all on summer holidays. They've started. No, no, it's not started yet. Still school is here. No. Inshallah, we will give homework. So in the muhadara or at the end of the muhadara, I will say this is your homework. Or well, this is what I want you to think about. Or this is the question I want you to answer in advance of tomorrow. And maybe if we have time the next day, we can ask about your homework. And we can mark the homework together. Someone can say, this is what I thought about. This is the research. This is the answer. So rule number one, please everybody have your Quran apps out or your Qurans itself. The preference is to have Quran. But at the very least, make sure you can search the ayat. So please... Tonight, we're going to look at at least four or five ayat. The first one is going to be <coughs> for you and I. Uh, we're going to be reading four or five ayat. So please have your Qur'ans ready. And during the muhadara, we will start to have a look at some of those ayat. So if you want to have it prepared now, please open chapter number three of Surat, or chapter number three of the Qur'an, Surat Ali Imran, verse 103. And we will look through many other ayats tonight as well, inshallah. If everybody is happy with these rules for our muhadarat, please recite a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wow. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. 
for the love of the awaited savior of humanity, Imam Al Mahdi, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Faraj Shari Sallu Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah Billahi Min Al Shaytan Al Rajim. Bismillah Al Rahman Al Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah Hiladi Hajana Li Hada. وما كنا لنحددي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا الممجد بشير المصدق المستفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam Al Mahdi, alayhi salam. My respected teachers, elders, brothers, and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Adamallahu jurana wa ajurakum bi musabina, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayh. In the year 2009, in London, there was a debate that took place under the title of is the Catholic Church a force for good in the world or not? You can YouTube this debate. And it became very, very famous in 2009, not only because of the participants, but also the way in which it sparked a number of questions that followed from it. Hosted by an organization called Intelligence Squared, they brought four leading thinkers, both for and against, two on each side, in order to debate this question. Is the Catholic Church a force for good in this world or not? On one side was Stephen Fry and Christopher Hitchens. For probably you've heard of these names, very well known famous intellectuals and also both atheists who were arguing that the Roman Church or the Roman Catholic Church had never been and was not a force for good in this world. On the other side, for arguing for it, was the Archbishop of Nigeria and a British parliamentarian, a convert to Catholicism and a vehement promoter of Catholicism, by the name of MP Adden, um, uh, by the name of MP Anne Widdicombe. In this debate, of course, both sides argued what they wanted to argue for. Those who were for and said that yes, the Roman Catholic Church was a force for good in this world, argued by saying that look at the number of people that we have tried to lift from poverty, for example. Look at the way in which we have created institutions to help people, be it with medicine or faith. We've helped people give, give them direction in life. And so on the balance of things, yes, the amount of work that has been done to support people around the world, the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. On the other side, Christopher Hitchens Stephen Fry, arguing, no, it has not been a force for good in the world, argued three or four major points in their debate. They said, for example, if you look at the history of the Catholic Church, the amount of rampage and murder, 
that it has wrought over across the world. And the amount of sectarianism, bloodshed between not only Christians and Muslims and Christians and Jews, but even within Christianity, such as the Catholics and the Protestants. They also argued, for example, that the Catholic Church has not really learned from its mistakes. And then they said, for example, today, what benefit do people have when it comes to the church? Now, this debate, not only interesting as it was in terms of a debate between those people who agreed and those people who disagreed, actually around the world, this particular debate sparked a number of questions. And amongst those questions were how those words and those debates actually reflected into religions other than the Catholic Church and other than Christianity. Many of us around the world were left questioning exactly the same questions, but in regards to our own faiths, whatever faith you belong to. If you belong, for example, to the Sikh faith or to the Hindu faith or to the Jewish faith or to the Islamic faith, you were left questioning exactly the same question. For example, is Islam a force for good in the world today or not? Now think about that question for yourself. If someone were to come and ask you, is Islam a force for good in the world? Or is Islam a force for good in Vancouver, greater Vancouver? Is Islam good and a force for good within Canada? Honestly, honestly, what would you say, number one? Number two, how would you prove it or measure it? This question is quite an important question when you begin to actually reflect on the way in which we practice our faith and whether our faith actually brings about positivity within the world. With this sort of question, is Islam a force for good in the world or is Islam a force for good in my own city? Makes us reflect on the way in which we have inherited our own faith and the way in which we practice our faith. We'll come back to this in a minute, inshallah. Our series over the next 11 nights, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, is under the title of, Is Islam a force of good for the world today? What does my Islam do, or what should Islam be doing today in order to make a positive impact in people's lives, such that it's actually able to change the lives of people, be it in a particular location or anywhere around the world. What we want to do in this series is to think about Islam as a force not only for good, but a force for liberation for people, a force for change and positivity in people's lives. And actually a force that grants people guidance within life so that no matter whom you are, whether you actually ascribe to Islam or not, Islam is actually a force for good within the world or a force for good within your city or within your nation. Now let us return back to this question. Is Islam a force for good within the world? Earlier on I asked you a few seconds ago, if someone was to come and ask you this question, hand on heart, how would you answer it? Not being sectarian saying we're good and this sect is bad. Or this part of the religion is good but it's bad here. If you were to genuinely answer this question for yourself today, do you see the deen of Islam as actually being a force for good? Be honest, how would you answer that question? And so the more that I reflected on that question, the questions that were being raised and actually came from it, immediately some of the answers that I might have given reflected many of the answers, for example, that was given by those who were in the debate. As we said, there were two people who were against the motion, two people who were for the motion. Those who were for the motion, for example, was the Archbishop of Nigeria, 
and a convert to Catholicism, a very famous lady by the name of MP Anne Widdicombe. When they answered, they answered in a very good way. They said, yes, Christianity and Catholicism is a force for good. Look at the number of orphans we take care of around the world. Look at the number of schools we have built. Look at the number of hospitals we have built. Look at the number of people we've given guidance and solace to in life. And I imagine that many of us could respond in a very similar way. There are many Aitam, Madrasa Aitam that are present within the world under the school of Ahl al-Bayt or in the name of Islam. Look how many millions of orphans we help around the world. Look at the number of different institutions that we have around the world. So immediately, reflexively, we might say, yes, this is a force for good within the world. What's interesting is, is that both of these two who are very much pro for the Catholic Church, they answered with a sort of tautology. They believed it was good because that is exactly what their belief system informed them to think about. But to what extent were they willing to engage critically with their own selves or critically within their own faith? That was very, very much left to be discussed. And similarly, the question has to be raised to myself. Would I be ready to engage critically with my faith in the way that my faith is being practiced? Or the way that we have inherited these behaviors and these rituals? This was something that was immediately upon me to answer, honestly. It also became a little bit further. The question itself had to be maybe reassessed. When I say, is Islam force for good in the world? What do I mean by good? I could reword the question and I could say, is Islam a force for change within the world? You see, if I was to come year after year and assess myself or assess my community, I might wonder and say whether I as a human being have actually productively changed myself over the last two years, five years, ten years. Sadly, by this ripe old age, I won't tell you my age, but by this age where the beard is now growing gray and the back is beginning to bend a little bit and my knees are starting to go and I can't play soccer as well as I used to play, as life begins to move, I have to be honest with myself and say, how much have I changed? Have I managed to rid myself of the same spiritual diseases that were within me one year ago, two years ago, five years ago. Subhanallah, if those same diseases are within myself, then my Islam is not really working for me. Can you see that? Do you see? Every year I come for the muhadara, every year we go for ziyara, every year, every year, every year. But if I am the same human being, then at what point has my Islam actually made progress within me, the way in which I'm practicing my Islam. Or similarly, if I come year after year to the muhadara and the same challenges exist within the community, then to what extent has my Islam managed to change the community? The lecturer has come and gone. We've cried for Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. We have done the latmiya. We've made sure that we've served food. We might have gone on a, a sort of a ziyara, we may have, whatever we have done, but if there's no tangible change within the community, and the challenges that were there two years ago exist again today, then I have to ask myself, the way in which I am practicing my Islam in the community, has it been a force for good? Has it been a force for change? I have to ask. The rituals are there, but the outcome has not yielded anything. Can you see? So immediately, these sorts of questions challenge the mind, challenge the community, and makes us introspect as to the way in which we are practicing our Islam. It also allows a spotlight to fall upon us because no longer is it only us looking at ourselves. 
with this sort of debate that millions of people around the world have watched about the Catholic Church, the spotlight can be turned on the Muslim community or on Islam as well. And those same questions may be placed upon me and you. And the question of whether Islam is actually a force for good in the world can actually be placed upon us. And no longer are we talking about this internally. Actually, there are millions of people externally that are judging whether Islam actually is valuable to the world today or not. Our series, inshallah, is going to raise this question time and time again. And we're going to try to answer it in the context of the global and the local challenges that we have today in 2023 and leading into the rest of this century. If you were to raise five challenges in the world today, what might those be? And how, how would your and my Islam actually solve those problems today? Think about that question very carefully. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Obviously, I'm coming from the context in the UK, and you're coming from a context of Canada and North America. Broadly speaking, being from the Western world, our challenges are broadly similar, correct? Nevertheless, there are some challenges that are particular to the UK and some challenges that are particular to Canada. Right now, <clears throat> in the UK and in European waters, every single week, every single month, there are refugees and asylum seekers that are drowning in the seas trying to be able to get to mainland Europe. Do you know about this? Have you come across this? Hands up. How many of you know that every single week in the... Hands up high so we can see. Right. So I'm going to say approximately there's about 20 hands up. How many people do we have here tonight approximately in total? 100? Yeah. So one-fifth know, for example, of the challenges that are occurring. Muslims, be they Iraqi Muslims, or be they Kurdi Muslims, or Syrian Muslims, wherever, Muslims especially, and many Christians from parts of Africa, Eritrea, and others, fleeing poverty, fleeing violence, fleeing climate destruction, actually seek to be able to go from either mainland Asia into mainland Europe, across from Turkey into Greece, or, for example, from North Africa towards sort of Italian waters. I don't know if you know this, every single week, dozens of refugees, Muslim refugees around the world, dozens of them drown in the seas trying to cross from North Africa to Italy, trying to get to France. Many Muslims, they arrive, for example, in Greece and they arrive in France in sort of makeshift refugee camps. I don't know if you've heard of the Eurostar. Have you heard of the Eurostar? It's a train, a very fast train, from the northern tip of France going across the English Channel trying to get to London Waterloo train station. Muslims, literally, are trying to get onto that train hold on to it, sadly many of them will fall and be crushed underneath that train. This is happening every single week. In front of our eyes, in front of the world's eyes. Think about this question very carefully. How does Islam benefit these people? Where is Islam's protection and the Muslim protection for these people? What are the solutions that Islam has to offer to thousands of refugees every single year that are drowning in the waters off the coast of Europe. Can you see? In the context in which I live, this question faces us literally every single day. Am I supposed to come here every single year, listen to the muhadara, cry for Hussein ibn Ali, go home, and nothing changes within my community? Nothing changes within my civilization? Is this what Islam is? Is this what Islam is? Can you see? 
is Islam actually a force for good in the world, needs to be raised. Across the world, I'll give you an example. And I touch on this immediately from tonight to provoke some thoughts amongst you. We have a sort of pantomime villain that wants to present himself and claim that Islam is a certain way. I'm sure you've all heard of Mr. Andrew Tate. You've all heard of him? Hands up, Henry. You've heard of Mr. Tate. See, more of you have heard of this guy than Muslims in their thousands drowning in waters trying to reach safety. Subhanallah. Think about that very carefully. Why have we heard of this guy? More than thousands of Muslims drowning every single year. Literally drowning. Children, babies, men and women. When you have a sort of a challenge of Andrew Tate's ideas and visions, I won't even say a vision of Islam, but visions in the way in which he conducts himself, the way in which he speaks, Islam and the way in which it is presenting itself with this challenge and the rearing of this ugly head, immediately, immediately we need to have a response to understand how Islam actually responds to this filth and to these sorts of misogynistic ideas. Where in the Quran and Ahadith do we see these issues? Can you see? Is Islam actually responding, a force for good? Is Islam actually able to respond to the challenges that we have? Or a third one, as an example. We have the impending crisis of global warming. Everybody here knows about global warming and climate change? Hands up. Everybody knows? I think everybody should know, especially as half the world is currently going through a heat wave. You see it in China, there's a heat wave, right? Yes? Yes? You see it in North America, there's a current heat wave, yes? 19 days of record heat in certain parts of the states. Record heat wave right now in Europe. You all see this and you all know about this, right? Tell me something. I'm asking a simple question. Where have you seen an Islamic response or a Shi'i response, a coherent response and plan for tackling climate change? Hands up. How many of you have ever seen it? I'm stating this for the record so that it's on the mic and it's being recorded. Not one person tonight has put their hands up. Can you see? Now I'm asking you an honest question. Is your Islam a genuine force for good in this world today or not? Is it actually solving the drivers of the crises that we have within our world? It could be an immigration crisis. It could be a climate change crisis. It could be the crisis of misogyny against women. Where is our Islam today? But I tell you what, tonight every single pulpit will make you weep. The question I ask is actually, will it resolve any of the issues that we have at hand? Our subject for these 11 nights, inshallah, is to be able to raise these topics. The ones that are actually impending crisis around the world and the actual challenges that we face, and to see whether the Qur'an and ahadith and interpretive spirit is able to respond to the challenges that we have and actually be a source of comfort, a source of liberation, a source of guidance, a source of change within the community, such that we can actually say, yes, our Islam is a source of goodness for the world. It can actually offer some coherent response to the challenges of the world. And this will be our subject, inshallah, over these 11 nights. What I want to be able to do with you tonight is the following. It's part of our introduction. I want to show you from the Quranic perspective how the Quran describes Islam to me and you. And I want to briefly, summarily, look at the sort of challenges that were present at the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma 
And I want to show you the extent of the change that he brought about in his own civilization within the span of just 23 years. Why? I want to show you how Islam actually changed people's lives 1400 years ago. And what the arkan and the maqasid of that change actually was. Why? Because if you can actually understand briefly that Islam genuinely changed people's lives for the better, it saw the sort of social ills that were present within pagan Arabia and intervened relentlessly, intervened until those evils and those spiritual diseases were no longer there, those exploitations and oppressions were no longer there, you will actually have a completely different vision as to what your Islam was. And you will also have a vision of what your Islam ought to be today. Because if true Islam actually intervened on those social ills and made a genuine change in people's lives, and it's not doing that today for me and for you as an example, if, if, if it's not doing that, then true, we are practicing Islam. But are we practicing Islam haqiqi, the Islam that was in accordance with the type of Islam that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi brought? You see, I'll list for you the types of challenges that were there at the time of the Prophet. And you'll see how much the Qur'an, how much the Prophet intervened relentlessly to stop those exploitations, to stop those oppressions, and did not yield until those social ills and challenges were defeated. That's the way Islam was 1400 years ago. And I want you to measure mine and your Islam today against that sort of Islam, an Islam built with a force of liberation and guidance. Kindly open your Qur'ans, all of you, to chapter number 3, verse 103. Surah Al-Imran, verse 103. As we said, we're going to go through a number of ayat, and what I'd like for you to do is not only just read the ayat, but make a note of it. You know, you might have to screenshot it, write it down in your notes, and make a note of these ayat so that you can reflect on them later. You can raise them in discussion. It's not passive. You're not here just so that at the end of 11 nights, we go back home and nothing has changed in our lives. We have a record of these ayat. We can refer back to them time and time and time again. Let's have a read of this ayah. Verse 103. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَاَعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold fast by the covenant of Allah altogether and do not be disunited. وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَةِ إِخْوَانًا And remember the favor of Allah on you. When you were enemies, then He united your hearts. And by His favor, you became brethren. So you all know that prior to Islam, the way the Arabs of Hejaz were living was that they were tribes constantly at war with one another. When I say constantly, I mean that they had so much war that at times their wars between these tribes lasted for so long that the tribes forgot what they used to be fighting about. They used to fight over horse races. They used to fight over their idols. You'll remember that when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina al Munawwara, he was invited by the Ansar, who were Banu Aus and Banu Khazraj. You'll remember they said to him, Ya Rasulullah, we've been fighting for 200 years to the extent that we have depleted our resources completely. We need you to come and intervene in us to make sure that there's no more fighting between Banu Aus and the Khazraj. So look at how Allah describes the situation. That generally the Arabs... What were they doing? إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً 
Look at the next part of the ayah. إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا Read this next part. وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ Look at how Allah describes the way in which these people were living. You were on the brink of a pit of fire. Now think about this carefully. Who is saying this? Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is describing the way the Arabs were living at that time. When Allah Jalla Jalaluhu says a people are living as if they are teetering on the edge of a brink of fire, an abyss of fire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not using these words for poetry. He's saying, the way in which these people were living was so destructive, was so backwards, that it's as if they were living on the brink of a pit of fire. This is how they were living themselves. There's another ayah, Surah Al-Hijr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath. He says, La'amruka, I swear by your existence, O Muhammad, La'amruka, by your life, إِنَّهُمْ لَفِي سَقْرَتِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ Most surely, these Arabs, these pagans, they are wandering blindly in their intoxication. Now think about this very carefully. How are they living? If you were to list them very quickly, what would you say the Arabs were doing at that time? How were they living? We mentioned already that they were living in such a way that they were in constant war with one another, depleting one another's resources. Shall I give you a list of things as to how they were living 1400 years ago, just in case you don't know? This is how the Prophet had to begin his mission. What community, what practices, behaviors, attitudes were present when the Prophet came? Think about this very carefully. List these with me. When the Prophet started his movement, there was rampant infanticide. You know what infanticide is, right? Where they kill children and babies. You know this, right? They used to kill their own babies and children. Rampant infanticide. The prophet had to stop this. Did you know at that time they used to perform tawaf of the Kaaba naked, singing, clapping and dancing? Did you know this? The prophet had to intervene and stop these behaviors. Did you know at that time, they used to stop women from eating meat and only men were allowed to eat meat and nutritious foods because they didn't think that women had any value and they needed men to work in the farms. So they stopped women from eating nutritious foods. Did you know this? This was rampant in Saudi Arabia. Did you know at that time, they used to, the men, used to prostitute their own family members in order to pay off their own gambling debts. This was the norm. Did you know this at that time in Arabia? Think about these things very carefully. If you were the prophet, how would you enter into Islam? How would you enter these people into Islam and get people to stop these behaviors? Answer this question very carefully in your mind. Did the Prophet come and sprinkle fairy dust on their heads and then everybody became Muslim? Did that happen? No. The Prophet had to convince them with argument. The Prophet had to argue and fight and demonstrate that Islam was of value to them. And slowly, slowly, slowly people started changing their behaviors. It wasn't easy. They used to throw feces at the Prophet, didn't they? They used to cut open the insides of sheep and throw it on the Prophet Was it easy for the Prophet to change things? Famously, the Prophet has a hadith where he says, ma No Prophet has had to undergo what I have had to undergo. No one has had to bear the difficulties that I have had to suffer in trying to change these pagan people. But the Prophet stopped infanticide, didn't he? 
The prophet stopped wars between these tribes, didn't he? The prophet managed to redistribute wealth so that no longer were the poor poor and the super rich getting away with what they had. The prophet actually put in a coherent political system between these people. The prophet managed to give rights to women. The prophet managed to do this, he managed to do this, he managed to do this. Islam actually was a force for good. It managed to change the lives of people. Whatever was the challenge, the social ill at that time, Islam genuinely, relentlessly intervened in order to be able to change the status quo. I want to show you from the Quran, Allah mentions that there are arkan as to what Islam ought to be and how we can measure whether our Islam today is actually in line with that great maqsad of what Islam was 1400 years ago. Open your Qur'ans, inshallah. Chapter number 14, Surat Ibrahim, verse number 1. Everybody has the ayah? Or does anyone need extra time? Everybody has the ayah? Yes? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I want you to see how Allah describes what Islam ought to be. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Ra. Kitabun Anzalnahu Ilaika. Litukhrijan Nasa Minad Dulumati Ilan Noor. Alif Lam Ra. This is a book which we have revealed to you. Why? That you may bring mankind out of darkness and into light. What was Islam doing? Wherever there was ignorance and backwardsness, Islam addressed it. It didn't fear from it. It didn't run away from it. It didn't turn a cheek and a blind eye to it. It made sure that that darkness and ignorance was changed into light. This is a maqsad. This is an ultimate objective of Islam. We can measure whether our Islam is doing this and it is genuinely bringing people out of darkness and into light. We have to ask this question. This is one eye as an example. Turn, for example, Chapter number 17 of the Qur'an, Surat Al-Isra. Verse number 9. rahman rahim Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi. لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمُ وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمُلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا كَبِيرًا Surely this Qur'an guides to that which is most upright. Not upright a little bit. Not upright, يعني, taking one potentially positive statement from, you know, Andrew Tate, because it might be true, might not be true. It is guiding to that which is most upright. It is absolutely perfect and pure and pristine. Again, I have to ask myself, the way I am living my Islam, is it guiding people towards that which is most upright? Or am I mixing it with things that are not most upright? Think about these questions very carefully. What is my Islam to me today? Where do I take my Islam from? From these people? Or in the Quran Yahdi Lilati hiya aqwamu or yubashir al mu'mini. Another ayah. Can you see these arkan of what Islam ought to be? Open the Qurans again, chapter number thirteen. Surah al Ra'ad.
verse number 11. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم له مؤقبات من بين يديه ومن خلفه يحفظه يحفو يحفظونه من أمر الله for his sake the prophet صلى الله عليه وآله there are ملائكة following one another ahead of him behind him who guard him by Allah's command إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى because him, very famous ayah, Allah does not change the condition of a community until those people change themselves first. Can you see? A community, me and you, we are supposed to actually change our communities for the better. There should be marked progress within our communities. This is another one. Last ayah I want to show you for the moment. Turn to chapter number 7, Surah Al-A'raf. Verse 157. Chapter number 7, Surah Al-A'raf. Verse 157. Again, look at what mine and your Islam ought to be doing. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alladina yatabi unar Rasul and Nabi al Ummi, Alladina yajiduna hu maktubun endahum fit Torati wal injil, ya muruhum bil ma'rufi, wa yanha hum anil munkar, wa yu hello lahum at tayibati, wa yu harremu, wa yu harremu alihimul, chabaith. وَيَذَعُوا عَنْهُمْ إِصْرَهُمْ وَأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ Subhanallah. What is this Islam? And enjoins good and forbids evil. Makes lawful to them the good things and makes unlawful the impure things. It removes the burdens that are upon people and it breaks the shackles that are holding people back. Think about this very carefully. If I was to ask a very simple question, the sort of burdens that you see upon a society, their poverty, or the types of ideologies that are being forced upon people, where is my Islam today that actually confronts and challenges these things, actually guides this is the Islam that we need. هذه الأركان These principles that we have are what the religion of Islam ought to be in the way in which it was practiced. Now I want you to think about this last ayah of the Quran. I mentioned earlier Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Arabs as living on a brink of a pit of fire, Correct? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Arabs and he says to them that لَعَمْرُكَ إِنَّهُمْ لَفِي سَقْرَتِهِمْ يَعْمَهُونَ Most surely these people are wandering blindly in their intoxications. خوب. This is how Allah describes people at the time of the coming, the advent of our noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Think about this next ayah. Only 15 years into the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with these same people, Allah reveals another ayah about them. You know what Allah says? Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat min nas. You are the best of people heralded for mankind. Can you see? At one point, Allah is lambasting these pagans, saying, look at the way in which you live. You're burying your daughters alive. There is theft from the more powerful tribes, from the 
least powerful tribe. There's constant war amongst yourselves. You are performing tawaf of the Kaaba naked. You are literally prostituting your own family members to pay off your own debts. These were the practices of the pagans at that time. Allah lambasts them in the Quran. Only 15 years later into the presence of the Prophet, Allah says, you are the best of people that have been heralded for mankind. What an example you are for mankind. Imagine the trajectory of growth. Imagine the change in behaviors in these people. That is what our Islam ought to be. That it sees a community that is behaving in a certain way, that is riddled with certain social ills, and it's not afraid to challenge. It doesn't turn a blind eye to the immoralities, to poverty, to exploitation. It's not ambivalent to them. It relentlessly intervenes so that lives are saved. Souls are rescued and redeemed. And the people become an example for the rest of humankind par excellence. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrija linnas. Your homework is the following. If you want to write it down. I know sometimes when we go to school we try to avoid the homework, right? But here you're not allowed. The homework is this. If someone came to you today and said, we're going to have a debate. The title of the debate is, is mine and your Islam a genuine force for good in this world? What would you say? I don't mean I would say yes or I would say no. I mean, how would you answer it? How would you prove that your and mine Islam is actually working for people. That is actually changing lives over a period of time. That our communities are actually growing and changing in accordance with these arkan al majmu'ah that we mentioned earlier on from the ayat. What do we say? Right? It takes people. لِتُخْرِجَ النَّاسِ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى nur. That is actually lifting the burdens of society's shoulders and breaking the shackles of backwardsness that hold them back. Is my Islam doing this? Is it a force for good in the world? Your homework is to reflect on this question honestly and genuinely. Maybe tomorrow, if someone or two people feel comfortable, one from the sisters, one from the brothers, you can stand up and at the beginning of the muhadara, you can reflect on this question, you can actually answer it. Be honest, you can say yes, you can say no, you can say maybe, but be prepared to answer. Why do you think what you think? How would you justify it? How would you argue it? How would you prove it to someone that challenged you for this debate and this discussion? Inshallah, our series is going to look at the challenges that are in front of us and how Islam ought to be responding to these challenges, and liberating minds, and guiding people, helping them in the world today, inshallah. You all know very famously that when Hussein ibn Ali sallallahu alayhi departed from the city of Medina, for the last time, he gave a wasiyah to his brother Muhammad al Hanafiya. He says to him, Inni lam akhruj ashiran wala batiran wala mufsidan wala zalima. Wa inna ma kharajtu li talabil islah fi ummati jaddi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Think about this statement. I'm not rising against the evil tyrant Yazid. Because I'm doing this for fame, or I'm doing this in order to get rich, 
or I'm doing this because I'm causing mischief or oppression. None of these reasons as to why I am rising. I'm rising for one reason and one reason only, and that is islah, reform in the ummah of my grandfather. Think about this very carefully. If we have described Islam as, a, as an intervening, liberating force for good in the world, when Hussein ibn Ali alayhi, says, لِطَلَبِ islah fi ummati jaddi, what do you think he meant by islah? What type of Islam was he trying to return the ummah back to? And how can we measure whether we are on that path of Islah or not? Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam, when he was threatened with death, and he knew that he had to depart Medina, he went to visit the grave of his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, before departing. One narration says, Imam al Hussein went to the grave of the Prophet, but that he saw something like a light emanating from that grave, and so he left that night and would return again the next night in order to visit the Prophet. When he visited the Prophet, he sits by the grave and he begins to weep and he begins to cry at his situation. He begins to weep over his desire to leave this world behind and be joined with his grandfather. He performs his salah and according to the hadith, he begins to doze in the state of sajda. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi visits Hussein ibn Ali in his dream in those moments. Do you know what his words are to him? According to the hadith, the Prophet comes and holds Hussein ibn Ali to his chest and then kisses Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the forehead between the eyes. And then he begins to say to him, Oh my dear son, May my father be sacrificed for you. Think about that. That is the Prophet saying, May my father Abdullah be sacrificed for you, O oh my grandson Hussein. Then he says, It is as if I see that you are wounded so much that your blood is oozing and pouring from your body. And that you are being slaughtered by a group of people from your own ummah, from this ummah. He says to him, Oh my son Hussein, your grandfather is waiting for you. Your father is waiting for you. Your mother is waiting for you. Your brother is waiting for you. But there is a special lofty station in Jannah that cannot be obtained unless and until you go through the position of martyrdom. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, can you imagine this moment? What he wants to do, he doesn't want to leave the side of Rasulullah. He wants to say to him, Oh my grandfather, take me with you. But all Rasulullah can tell him is, Wake from this sleep and leave, for now you have a responsibility to go and achieve martyrdom. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam gathered his family members, he gathered his companions, and he began to depart. His own family members came to him and they said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, we understand why you are taking Abbas. We understand why you are taking with you your Akbar. We even understand why you are taking with you your Qasim. But why do you take with you the women and the children on this journey? Why does Sayyidah Zainab in Umm Kulthum come with you? Why does Ruqayya come with you? And why do these children come with you? The famous responses 
Allah wishes to see them in captivity. Allah wishes to see how they will brave what is going to occur to them on the 10th and the 11th of Muharram and beyond. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam departs. As he gets to Mecca, it is said that he receives some 400 letters on a single day. This is how many people from around the Ummah write to Hussein ibn Ali and call upon him to rise against Yazid. There are letters coming from Kufa. There are letters coming from Yemen. There are letters that are coming from Egypt. And now Imam al Hussein alayhi salam has to make this decision does he allow his blessed blood blood to be shed in and around the sanctuary of the Kaaba no he departs from Mecca it is said that as he is on his journey he now sends his ambassador Muslim Ibn Aqil to go towards Kufa when Muslim arrives in Kufa after many days and weeks he manages to gather so many of the Shia together it is said that he has 18 thousand swords but at the moment in which Ibn Ziyad declares and says if there is anyone who is going to be with Muslim their family will be arrested and they will be killed as well thousands leave Muslim Ibn Aqil it is said that when Muslim is captured he can only cry out and say this is the first betrayal that occurs this is the first betrayal of the Shia upon Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. What happens is that Muslim's head is severed from his body. Muslim's body is thrown on the floor. It is taken by the horses and dragged across the streets of Kufa. It is said that in the last moments of Muslim's life, that he calls out, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. I want you to imagine Hussein ibn Ali hearing that salutation come to him our dhakirin tell us that Imam al Hussein comes towards the daughter of Muslim he sits down beside her and begins to stroke her face and began to pat her on the head she looks Hussein in the eyes and says oh master Imam al Hussein why are you doing this to me you never act like this except with an orphan with tears in his eyes Imam al Hussein can only say, Oh Hamida, now you are my daughter. My sons will become your brothers. My daughters will become your sisters. We will be looking after you because your father Muslim has been massacred in Kufa.